Okay, that's it. That's gonna really help me. <laughs> Here you guys. Classification and structures is part two for materials. All the way back to atoms. Um, and uh, we're talking about protons, neutrons, electrons and all that jazz. But before we do, I just want to um, talk about how big atoms are. Um, in fact, you can't actually see an atom. It's impossible. Because to see something, you have to use light. And light waves are too big for atom to bounce off atoms properly. So they can't see atoms with an optical microscope. They can't see atoms with an electron microscope. They can't see atoms with a microscope. There is one method. Let's say this was your metal surface. They, they have a probe that comes down to a point, and the point is one atom on the end of the point, so you can't get any sharper than that. And that probe is then brought down and uh, rides over the surface. They make a scan of the surface. They're not actually looking at it, they're feeling it. They're feeling these atoms, and they can make a picture that way. So uh, it could still be a theory. Maybe there's no such thing as atoms, but unlikely, because uh, it certainly follows all of the chemistry that we do, and even right down to moving a probe over the surface, you find that there's these little bumps that look like atoms. So we can see molecules, we can see um, bumps and lumps of molecules, but we can't actually see an atom. One of the other things about atoms, they're a little bit hard to see too, because the solid part of the atom is the nucleus, and the rest of the atom is electrons floating around to a scale of about 10,000 to 1. So the nucleus is so small that the atom is mostly empty space. As a matter of fact, it makes you wonder why everything isn't transparent because um, there's hardly any solid. It's only the little tiny nucleus in the middle. And that also explains why if you make metal thin enough, like a very thin foil, it's, it becomes starting to get transparent now. But then you've got the other problem. Well, how come some, you can have glass that's a foot thick and it's transparent? It's all very mysterious. So just want to look at the scale, uh, first of all, <coughs> there's a human. As we zoom in, this is a, a one metre ring there, so that represents uh, one metre, and as we zoom in, we'll get down to one millimetre. So there's one millimetre, we've got ants and seeds and things. So down to one thousandth of a metre, and we still scroll in a bit more, and we have one micron, which is one thousandth of a millimetre. Okay, by the time we get down towards the micron, we're starting to see um, things that you would only see in a microscope. So we've got these little miniature bugs, um, and now we're just at, just at the range where we can almost start to see things like blood cells, which are a couple of microns across, and some uh, large-scale DNA structures, and uh, a clay particle, one micron. That's, uh, that would make muddy water, that stuff. <coughs> And there, there's um, the wavelength of light now. You can start to see how, how big um, violet colored light would look. So we zoom in another thousand times and we have one thousandth of a micrometer, which is now a nanometer. Now nanometers are, are kind of like the limit of human um, smallness, really. We can't really work uh, in any scale below about a nanometer. A nanometer, you're seeing molecules, um, even an atom, like a very large atom, is almost uh, at that scale. And if we keep going down a bit more, we've got hydrogen atoms now, um, sub nanometers. So we're talking about a millionth, a thousandth of a millionth, so it's a billionth of a meter, is uh, getting down towards atomic scale. But atoms themselves will be less than a nanometer. Just look up scale of the universe and this is flash animation you can go the other way as well get bigger and bigger have a look at um, planets and stars and back to the atom a proton and a neutron are considered to be a mass of about one now what units are we going to use for mass the mass unit that we use in atoms is called the atomic mass unit not a very imaginative name but the atomic mass unit is given one for the weight of a proton or a neutron, more specifically a proton. So if a proton is one, the neutron is pretty much the same, an electron is super light, it's only like one out of, what's that, one out of 2,000 or something, of the weight of one of these. So we can pretty much ignore the weight of the electrons, 
and just count up the neutrons, the black ones, and the protons, and that will give us the weight of the atom. Now this atom we have here is carbon. It has six protons, which means that that's called carbon. If you have seven protons, it's not carbon anymore. And it's also got six neutrons. They tend to balance, particularly the smaller atoms have the same number of protons and neutrons. The electrons are a negative, so they have mass and a positive charge, that's a proton. Mass without a charge, that's a neutron, neutral. And electrons have a negative charge and no mass, or almost no mass. So we have to balance the number of protons with the number of electrons. If we have six protons, we need six electrons. The nucleus is very small compared to the diameter of the, at the electrons, so the electrons are taking up this much space. The nucleus is this tiny little dot in the middle, you can hardly see it. It turns out that if you were to make a solid lump of nucleuses with no electrons, the density of that material would be so high, would be so heavy, that you wouldn't be able to hold it. Um, you couldn't even hold it on, on steel, so it would just drop through everything. The, the weight of it would be so high. <coughs> so solid nucleus is uh, uh, pretty hard to stop. <coughs> That's that scale thing. Um, now, I mentioned that you can't actually see atoms. Um, as far as being able to see things, this is a zoom up of a human hair. Now, but this was not done with optical microscope, this is done with electron microscope, which can, zoom, can look smaller. Uh, there's an electron microscope. They have to evacuate the thing so that electrons can be used instead of light waves. <coughs> this is an optical microscope. That's what human hair would look like with an optical microscope and you're getting towards the limit of light so this uh, light's starting to get a bit blurry a bit grainy looking now <coughs> because you can't get any smaller with light waves <coughs> alright now um, with atoms I've got another model here this one is the helium atom it has two protons and two neutrons so the mass of the helium is four and two electrons to balance the two protons Here's uh, one with three. This has three protons, three neutrons. Don't forget this is actually three-dimensional, so it's not in a flat plane. So this picture is a little bit better because it shows that the whole thing is three-dimensional. This one is called lithium. And lithium is the lightest metal you can get. If you can make something out of lithium, it would be really light. The only problem with lithium is um, it burns in air. So it's not very useful. <coughs> lithium here is uh, kept in a container of oil so the oxygen doesn't get to it and look how light it is it's floating in oil there's two types of reactions you can have with atoms you can either have a chemical reaction which plays around with electrons or you can have a nuclear reaction which plays around with the nucleus this is a chemical reaction we're reacting iron oxide also known as rust with aluminium which is a metal and it produces the, once you get some heat happening, this reaction occurs. The aluminium rips the oxygen off the iron and produces pure iron. And because the aluminium's got oxygen on it now, it's aluminium oxide, which is a ceramic. <coughs> so that's what they're doing here. Okay, this canister here has those two powders mixed in here. What were the two powders? Iron oxide, which is rust, and aluminium, pure aluminium, not aluminium oxide. Those two powders mixed in together here. They then put something to start the reaction going. So they put some, something very hot in there. Okay, that heat being generated is the reaction. That's the reaction of the aluminium taking on oxygen. So aluminium is basically burning because it's taking oxygen. It's taking, getting the oxygen from the iron oxide. That's produced a whole lot of uh, iron, but the iron with that heat is now molten iron. So we're putting molten iron into the uh, in between the tracks, welding the tracks together. And the excess iron just pours off into those little canisters here. They've got some clay around here to seal off the um, track so it doesn't pour out. Now wait for that to cool, and then you've got uh, welded two tracks together. That's so a chemical reaction. So chemical reactions include fairly exciting things like that, or an exploding bomb, that's, that's a chemical reaction. 
petrol burning, that's a chemical reaction. Uh, even rust is a chemical reaction. So when you're combining atoms together, and when you combine atoms together, what's going on is all to do with the electrons. So you, you're not touching the nucleus, it's still the same atom, the carbon atom is always the carbon atom. When you're breathing carbon, you know, you're getting carbon off sugar and it's adding to the oxygen, it makes carbon dioxide, you breathe out carbon dioxide. Uh, photosynthesis, they're all chemical reactions. A nuclear reaction, on the other hand, is when you're busting into the nucleus. And uh, here's an example of uranium, which is getting busted up and making particles, and those particles are then getting fired off and hitting another one, which then busts up and hits some more, and that makes a chain reaction. So because you shot one, that's enough energy to get a couple more going, and that will quickly expand into an explosion if it's not controlled, uh, which is an atomic atomic explosion or a nuclear explosion. Из-за воспоминаний с сахаром испытание вызвало огромный интерес и волнение во всем мире. В США его окрестили Джо-4. And here we have the first dozen atoms or so. Uh, hydrogen is the simplest atom you can get. It's one proton and one electron. You couldn't get any simpler than that. So the next atom up from that is helium, where you have two protons, two neutrons, that's four altogether, and then two electrons on the outside. Now there's another rule about electrons, and that is electrons go in um, shells. So the first shell of electrons is on the inside, can only handle two electrons. Once we fill the first shell, we can't fit any more electrons onto that shell. So when we want to add a third electron, we have to build a new shell around the outside. And then we have lithium, that metal that uh, we, saw, we saw floating in the oil. And we add another electron, we have to add a proton as well to balance it out. The proton, now that we've got four protons, the atom is defined as beryllium, which is another metal. Keep adding on electrons, adding on protons, adding on some neutrons, until we get all the way up to neon, which is number 10. We may have heard of most of those, but certainly carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Just quickly looking at the diameters of these atoms, surprisingly, they're not getting bigger and bigger. What, what's happening is lithium is actually quite large because when you add the next electron, it sits there pretty loose. This, this second shell that you're trying to form with an electron here. Now we have to balance that out. We've got three electrons, so we need another proton here so it's not charged. And uh, it would like to have another neutron too to keep it stable. So now we've got lithium. Now with lithium, this, this outside electron is held on very loosely. And it, uh, it can quite easily lose that. And that's why the diameter is large. And then as you begin to put more electrons onto this outer shell, it actually shrinks. So that neon, which has got all eight electrons on that outer shell, is actually smaller than lithium. Two is the magic number for the inner shell. It can handle two electrons. And I said uh, neon has eight. So it turns out that eight is the magic number for the second shell of electrons. Once you've got eight on there, it's very hard to rip one off because it's stable, it's packed in nice and tight and it doesn't want to let anything go. So neon does not lose electrons easily. But lithium, when it only had one, could easily lose that electron. This has a lot to do with how these atoms react to each other. <coughs> and here we have a periodic table. Well, first of all, they're arranged in order of the number of protons because the name of the atom is based on the number of protons. That's called the atomic number. Hydrogen is number one because it has one proton. Helium has two, etc., all the way down to about 92 naturally occurring atoms. Each atom uh, can, can make its own element. You can have pure iron, you can have pure carbon, pure mercury, pure gold. Some extra atoms that we've thrown in here because we have atomic reactions and things and we can find some extra ones that might live for a short while. We're more interested in these, these engineering ones further up. Each row is one of these electron shells. So the first row is just this first shell, hydrogen and helium. That's row number one. 
Row number two is now represented by the second shell. And it starts with lithium with one electron in the second shell and finishes with neon that has eight electrons in the second shell. Add one more electron, we're on to our third shell now. And this would be sodium. We've had an extra electron, we're going to have to have 11 protons and 11 neutrons in there and one electron on the outside. Very similar to lithium, sodium has one electron and that electron is held pretty loose. Go back to lithium. Lithium has one electron in the second shell. On the opposite side of the periodic table, we have fluorine, which has got seven electrons in the outer shell. Guess what? Fluorine would like to have eight, and lithium would like to get rid of this unstable shell that only has one. So it's very easy for fluorine to rip off the electron off lithium and add it to fluorine. So now fluorine's got eight, which makes it happy, and lithium has lost that loose shell, and it's only got two electrons now. When you take an electron away, you've lost a negative charge, so this now is a positively charged atom called an ion. This one has an extra electron now, so it is a negatively charged fluorine atom. And positive and negative attract. So now we have an attraction between these two, and that's created a compound. Two different atoms joined together. And this is one type of chemical reaction. We're making a reaction between lithium and fluorine, an electron swapped from one atom to the other, there was an energy exchange, and now they're stuck together. Here's a similar example if you go up to the next shell, sodium, which is uh, the, on the third shell. It doesn't react in the air, but it does react in water. <coughs> you just dump, drop it in water, it burns. Dang. Not really. <laughs> 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 All right, so sodium's pretty dangerous stuff. And uh, chlorine, which is on the other side of the periodic table, let me just go back to that periodic table again. Okay, we're talking about sodium here, number 11, versus chlorine, number 17, here. It's got seven on the outer shell, it's got one on the outer shell. Put those two together, you get some fireworks. Chlorine, by the way, the atom by itself is a gas at room temperature, and uh, a very poisonous gas. <coughs> right, so here they are. There's sodium, it's got one electron. There's chlorine with seven. Chlorine steals the electron off sodium. There it goes. And there's my positively charged sodium, negatively charged chlorine. A small piece of sodium metal is placed in a flask containing yellow chlorine gas. The flask also contains sand to prevent the heat which will be generated by the reaction from cracking the glass. Initially, no reaction is observed between the sodium and the chlorine. The reaction will be initiated by adding a drop of water to the sodium. And it makes sodium chloride, which is, so, which is table salt. <clears throat> so you've got these two highly toxic, poisonous substances. This thing you put out in your mouth, you'll be in trouble. And this thing, you're not even allowed to breathe it. And you combine them together and you can make the salt. So one thing to remember is that once you have a chemical reaction, the properties are significantly different. Sodium chloride forms a cubic structure like this, so that the crystals themselves tend to be cubic in shape. Now this type of bond is called an ionic bond. Ionic bond, because you've made an ion out of two atoms, one's positive, one's negative, they attract each other. Now in, in engineering, the, the most common type of ionic bond would be with ceramics. For example, aluminium oxide, <coughs> which has uh, two aluminiums combined with three oxygens, it's a bit of a larger molecule, it produces this hard stone material used for grinding. It's quite a common ceramic. So that's one type of bond, ionic bonds.